I came to know IHCD uh, by being a user expert. Uh, right now I have a very non-apparent vision impairment. When my German Shepherd is in tow, it is very apparent. Um, and I'm here today to uh, introduce you to Matthew Schifrin, uh, one of our uh, very favorite user experts, uh, one of many. Uh, Matthew has started a uh, organization and a website uh, called Legos for the Blind, uh, where he and friends have put on a, a lot of thinking and a lot of creativity around making uh, the childhood favorite of Legos accessible to the blind. Uh, and I, of course, will let him talk to you more about that. Um, some of my other favorite things about Matthew, he is a uh, composer, a musical composer, and currently uh, getting ready for his uh, college auditions. So you can send him all your prayers and good vibes and karma uh, this February and, and March and whatnot as he auditions for school. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's uh, my way of introduction. So I'm gonna uh, pass it off to Matthew who will tell you more about Legos for the Blind and what we will be doing together today. Thank you so much, Maggie, and thank you to everyone for taking the time to come out here. There could be a billion other things you guys could be doing, but you have chosen to unleash your inner child and build with plastic, which is great. So, uh, first I want to give you a little bit of background about how Lego for the Blind came to be and what what our plans for the future are and how we start. So, <clears throat> this all started with my family friend, Nina, and she she has a gift for adapting things. Ever since I was little, she could braille every board game imaginable. And there's this game called Set, and some may know it, some may not. Uh, it's one with shapes, and you need to, some are filled in, some are different colors, some are big, some are small, and you need to match these shapes. It's very hard, I always lose. But uh, this game was considered unadaptable by anyone, because it's very visual. But nonetheless, she was able to adapt it. But, and ever since I've been little, I have been playing with Lego. My parents got me a Duplo train. Duplo is the larger, blockier uh, cousin of Lego that you see toddlers throwing at each other. And um, so after that, I kind of graduated up to Lego, and I wanted to build sets. And so the way we do it is my dad and I, we would um, purchase some sort of set, and we'd build it together. He'd tell me what piece to put where, and I'd put it there. And I'd find it, and I'd do that. But the trouble with that method was, it was very, very time consuming. It would take us two, three, maybe four hours to build a fairly small set with three to 400 pieces. And I, we just got busier. I grew older, I went to school, dad worked, and we had no time for this. And uh, I would tell Anita, oh, this is a great, this is a great thing, but there's no way there's no way for us to do it. So one day, it's my it's 13th birthday, and I'm excited because birthday. And, <laughs> and so uh, Nina comes, and she gives me this large grilled binder in this box. And the box has a label on it. And I read the label, and it says that it's a Lego set. It's a Middle Eastern castle. And I'd secretly been stocking this set on Amazon because I, um, I really liked to look at all of the fancy things that I could never do. And I'd be like, oh, this is a pirate ship with firing cannons. Nope, can't build that. And so there would be this constant string of, nope, can't build that. Until then. So what she had in that binder was she had custom braille, a set of text-based instructions on a Perkins Brailler. If you guys have not used a Perkins Brailler to braille large amounts of text, consider yourselves lucky. It's very heavy and takes hours upon hours of time. And she had put in that time to make this large set completely accessible. She'd named all of the pieces, she'd given them special names, and she had made the best order possible for a blind person to be able to assemble, assemble this set. And I assembled it, and I remember I was like in the beginning stages of this assembly, and I remember singing to myself, oh, I'm just like a normal kid, I'm building with Lego. And it was really an empowering feeling because for, for blind people, Lego acts as a real sense of scale. 
if you're building a large architectural building, like the Tower Bridge or Big Ben, you really get the sense of, OK, I know this is uh, three, four feet high on the table. So if it's four feet high in this context, it must be giant in real life. And it really, not only, give, not only does it give you a sense of scale, but it really allows you to see the intricacies of the buildings. Lego is very good at realism. And all they take a lot of care to make their sets very, very detailed. So like, if we use Big Ben as an example, you get the statues outside, and you get the rotating clock handles, and all of the spires, and all of this intricacy, which really makes the set useful as a tool for blind people. Because now we have, we have access, and we have information that we did not have before. If someone, if we're driving in New York, and someone says, oh, Matt, we're passing the Empire State Building. I've never seen the Empire State Building, but with a LEGO set, you're like, oh, I know what that looks like. And LEGO has released a, a line called the Architecture Line, which they take famous buildings, the Burj Khalifa, the Capitol Building, the Brandenburg Gate, whatever, and they make LEGO sets out of them. And our goal at some point in the near future will be to adapt more of those more of those realism-based sets. And so after this first Braille set, Rita uh, had a couple of ideas. She realized that she didn't need to Braille anything. She could just, I have a note taker on me, and it connects to the internet, has a Braille display, I can read my emails and Word documents. And so she realized that she could just type this up and email it to me. And then the great thing about that would be, A, it would be a much more uh, portable solution, and V, I could correct any errors, which is what I do before I post to the website, which is on the projector behind me. Um, and so after that, we really kind of went full steam ahead. Lego has these modular buildings, which are kind of like dollhouses. And they have very detailed interiors. They have restaurants and fire stations and movie theaters and all of this great tactile detail. What's also great about LEGO is it gives you a nice idea of the layout of a real building. You, if you were to, if they model a real building, you could be like, oh, I get it. So we go in the front door, we turn left, we turn right, and there's the living room. And just little things like that, which they, they may have not done intentionally, but it's very, very useful for those with visual impairments. And so after this, we did a couple of buildings. and the amount of Lego we were purchasing and building increased. And so we thought, why not? I had always, once I found that this could be done, I thought, you know, we must, we must get it out there. We must give it to someone. Because someone else must. I mean, there's got to be some little kid out there who wants to do this, but who can't. I and mean, we should give it to that kid. So we made a website, Lego for the Blind. And uh, we post all of our instructions there. I'm going to update it in a couple of weeks with more sets that we've recently corrected. And then after that, um, our website got onto Popular Science, and MSN, and AOL, and Time for Kids has an article about it, and this YouTube channel called BrainCraft, which is a neurology psychology channel. They sent me an email, and they were like, oh, can you make a video? And I said, sure. And they made a great documentary with a lot of um, a nice footage of actual the actual building process and a lot of research into blind people and how their brains are different from those of sighted people. And that already has 65,000 views on YouTube. And so after this, we are now expanding. Besides Lego, we are doing more science toys. We've made snap circuits accessible so that blind children can build electrical circuits. And we are also hoping to start a robotics camp in the summer so that blind children can program Lego Mindstorms robots independently using an accessible programming language. Because in the 21st century, technology education for blind children is woefully inadequate. I mean, yes, they teach you how to browse the web, and write documents in Word, and make PowerPoint presentations, and that's all fine and dandy. But to be able to be creators of content, you must also know how to consume content and create content. And that creation of content is what is missing. And so uh, we found this text-based language, and we're hoping to launch this camp in the summer, and just so that blind children can get that experience. Because programming classes in high school are all inaccessible. They all use graphical 
languages of programming, and we can't use them as blind people. And so a lot of blind students are left out of computer science in general because it just doesn't work. And so we're hoping to get them excited and interested. And the real, also another goal, is really for them to feel confident with this Lego, with that um, robot, whatever it is. We want them to feel welcome because computer science is a field with a diversity problem. And it's very important to kind of wiggle that gap and make it a little bit wider and a little bit more accepting. Um, and this robotics camp is the easiest way to do that. So that's what we're going to do. And hmm, judging by the fact, I'm going to keep yammering slightly because you guys are still consumed with edible things. <laughs> so you please keep munching, and I will keep discussing. Um, so besides this Lego thing, we also have a couple of other projects. Uh, I was earlier talking about how Lego helps people orient themselves to buildings. Not only that, but you can notate music with Lego. Another friend of mine and I, we invented a system that allows blind people to notate music independently using Lego bricks. And so let's say you go to music school and there's a theory exam where they play you a rhythm and they want you to notate it. You could potentially whip out your temporary container of Lego and be like, hey, professor, I have it notated. And then you can just read it out. And um, articles about that are going to come out in Future Reflections, which is the National Federation of the Blinds magazine for parents and teachers of blind children. And besides that project, I'm also, I was talking earlier about visual programming languages. I'm working with MIT and the Scratch team to make their coding language, which is one of the most popular to use in schools all over the country and the world, we're working to make that accessible to blind people so that they can also use block-based languages independently. And there are also a couple of other things that we're doing. I am in the process of developing an app for to read stoplights for blind people, a smartphone app, because though you do have auditory pedestrian signals, that beep or buzz or whatever, they are often broken and they don't always work and they're not always reliable. And not every place has them. You can't, not every intersection you go to. We have them downtown, and we don't have them other, in other places. So for the longest time, I couldn't cross the street near my house because the traffic was unpredictable, and there was no auditory signal. Only in the last month has the amount of auditory signals, um, at least in that area, increased. And we hope it'll stay that way. But until then, this app would allow for much safer travel for the people. And it would work offline so that you can go anywhere where there are stoplights that work like American ones do. And you could walk around there. And then there would be a GPS component built in so you'd be able to query what intersection you're at. And you, it would have a database of stoplights. So once you would approach one, it would buzz and say, oh, you're at the I don't know, intersection of Century and Beacon. And then you could take a picture and it would tell you what code is in real time. And just one last project before we actually begin doing things. Um, the other project that I'm working on is a comic book access project for blind people. And we're partnering with Marvel, DC, and Valiant to make their comics accessible using the scripts that authors write. Because when you have a comic here, author writes the script, gives it to the artist, the artist draws it, and then they, they and revising the public. So we're hoping to make those into full cast audio dramas with description, kind of like blind people watch movies where there's a guy with a deep voice in the background telling them what's going on. And so we're going to implement that sort of thing. And uh, these projects are just pet projects. All of this stuff is great, but it's kind of hard to juggle because it either works, I'm applying to college, and I'm going to be in college. so. It's going to be hard to juggle everything, but we're certainly going to try to update the site and keep it up and running. People have emailed me and they're like, oh, could you make this set and that set and the other set accessible? And we really try to do our best, but the adaptation process is very long. It takes 40 to 60 hours to adapt a large set. And so it's a large time commitment, but it's very worth it. 
and you will experience that worthy feeling as soon as you finish munching. These are all very inspiring projects that you're working on. Thanks for sharing them. Um, just the first question that occurs to me, maybe it'll become obvious um, as we work together, but do you build them, do you, when you do these sets yourself, do you build them alone or do you work with someone? I work with someone okay. because these have, the instructions I get have errors in them and okay. so oftentimes you'll get a couple of steps that don't make sense and then someone like mixed up a couple of numbers and everything went south. So Right. I because do, the, the primary thing I'm thinking of is like Lego doesn't package their bits no. by color. No, it so, does not. So like so how do you how do you I guess you have someone telling you? There is a sorting you? guide on the website uh -huh. on Lego for the Blind. Basically what you do is you go a sighted person has to do this. Um, so you go through your set and your instructions step by step and you take a couple of steps at a time and you put the pieces needed for those in zip locks. You basically would go and compare the text based and the graphical instructions mm -hmm. to see what, what parts are prevalent where. And you'd put the parts for each couple of steps in a separate zip lock. And then you label them in braille and put them in a larger bag. And you get multiple large bags per set. So you'd say like, let's say your set has two instruction booklets, you'd have a large bag that's labeled book one, large bag one, steps one through twenty. Mm -hmm. And usually the step numbers do, the bag numbers do try to correlate with the step numbers as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So step four in the instructions will be bag four, hopefully, if we've done our job. Cool. My question was, um, so you did a lot of Lego sets. So, which one are you like currently working on now, and uh, maybe how many sets have you done like completed fully? How many sets have I fully completed? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I just wonder. There's like eight, eight or nine yeah. that are fully done. I'm currently not working on anything. Nice. Okay. College, but okay. Um, um, I was hoping to start uh, a train. I'm trying. Yeah. I like trains. Trains are wonderful. <laughs> and ninjas. Ninja trains. Even better. Well, I usually get the ninja sets. So. True. Those are very fun. And we will try. We're trying to expand our lineup. We're mostly kind of dealing with realism, so. That's good. We're trying to do like a lot of city stuff, but mm -hmm. we might expand yeah. into a superhero ninja or whatever. That's good. But, Thanks. Hi. Um, I have a question about the Lego Mindstorms mm -hmm. and the camp that you're running. Yep. Um, do you have a, an end goal for that other than getting kids to program them? Um, are you in contact for, or familiar with the first Lego Robotics program? Um, yes, I am familiar with them. I don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, but they are the ones responsible for forming teams of roboticists yes. who do certain challenges. Yes. I was aiming for this to be more of a kind of intro, and my goal mm -hmm. is for them to really understand the text-based language, because what's good about these languages, either NXC or LEDJOS, LEHOS, however you pronounce it, which are C and Java-based, is they work like any other programming language. And so all the skills that they learn from whatever robot language they learn are transferable to any other language that they want to learn down the line because these these are fairly similar. Uh, the syntax is fairly similar, like uh, with languages. Uh, just because I I'd love to form a robotics team, but I think the camp is a is a kind of better introduction because the robotics team is a great idea, but it requires much more. Yeah, it requires a competition that you can actually participate yes. in. A lot of them are very site based, and there are. Um, the Texas School for the Blind, I know, has a robotics team where they do participate in competitions and they do, uh, they have low vision and blind students who program together and the low vision students are responsible for checking that the robots don't like, crash into a wall and the blind ones are going write the code. Okay. And then I had a question about the um, instructions that you're working, well, not working on right now, but mm -hmm. are you open to having other people write instructions for the website. Oh, of course, that would be wonderful. It would be quite self-centered of me to say, no, Are you getting any kind of uh, institutional support from LEGO? You think no. it would? I've tried to contact LEGO. LEGO 
does not want anything to do with this. They're like, yeah, you can post this on your website, but don't bug us anymore. <laughs> so I don't bug them. We use some abbreviations in our instructions to make it less wordy. This is especially useful for people who are reading them on Braille displays or note takers where they can't skim text and where they just have a single line of text that scrolls. So <clears throat> there at the top, if you see the letter F, that means flat. Like F2 by 1 is a flat 2 by 1. FS is flat smooth, that being a, a piece or brick that has no, no studs or bumps or buttons, whatever you want to call it. Ver is vertically. Hor is horizontally. Sim is symmetrically. And PP is previous piece. So I hope that's not too much to remember. But and at any point during the build process, if you if you see something you don't understand, please shout and be like, what's PP me? That's totally fine. Anything that's marked flat is thick. Okay. Flat implies thick. So flat two by one is going to be a plate or a flat piece. And just normal two by one will be a thick piece or a brick, as I call it. What I was thinking is, uh, one person wears the blindfold and hunts for the pieces, and then another person could um, check the graphical instructions. Another person, if they wish, could compare with the text-based ones, and then the other two people could observe, uh, what, do whatever, take notes if they wish, whatever they want. And my goal, since I want a lot of the entire an entire table's worth to be uh, acquainted with the system, we can switch people at any point. So if you guys at some point, if someone uh, is getting tired or they're getting frustrated or whatever, they can totally switch to the person on their right or on their left or just say, hey, whoever, random person whose name I haven't yet learned or of course I don't recognize because I'm blindfolded. Could you take this from me? I feel like blind or blind people can custom build, and they, they sometimes do. The only trouble is that usually blind, like if you're not building a lot of sets, you don't have a very big vocabulary. Right. So right. I would just like stack random things and be like, hey, it's a person with a plan on his head. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a chance to think about how this kind of um, instruction design could be applied other places. Um, Besides building IKEA furniture. Yeah. <laughs> of course. A lot of uh, design uh, schools or design thoughts um, would call an activity like this sort of a simulation. Um, some of our interns this morning uh, called it an empathy activity. Um, and at IHCD, what we like to talk about a lot is that um, simulations or personas or, or these empathy activities um, aren't enough to uh, bring us to a place where people are, are designing things well. Um, so you being blindfolded and getting to interact with the, these instructions and the Legos and this tactile uh, plane um, was a really cool opportunity for you to be introduced to these instructions and introduced to a new, uh, I heard you all a lot talking about a, a new vocabulary for describing things, um, which I thought was really cool. Um, but we always emphasize um, in addition to these opportunities and these kind of experiences, we like to emphasize um, really listening to people's lived experiences and um, their experiences as a person, Matthew's experience as a person who is uh, blind and has lived his, his whole life blind, uh, and interacting with these instructions and Legos is very different than when, when you're blindfolded. One of my observations walking around was I thought it was really cool. Each table had its own way of adapting the task even further. We would guide the piece that was needed next kind of closer to their hand so that they wouldn't spend as much time trying to look for the little piece. Mm -hmm. And then one person would follow along with the visual instruction manual to kind of make sure that we were doing it visually correctly while the other person would read um, and then the other person would just kind of help bounce around to each one. Um, so in the end we got like 75% done. We all used the blindfold, we all each got a turn. Um, it was very interesting to, but very uh, difficult as well, but yeah this is very good 
uh, learning experience, and I would say 25% was completed. Everyone who wasn't blindfolded sort the colors out and told them where uh, each color was in relation to them, left, right, center. And then as we switched, we made sure each person was oriented to the colors before we started um, each step. That's also certainly a great way to do it if you have the time and energy and manpower to sort everything by color. <laughs> for, it's easy for the small one, but I'm sure it's much, much harder for a huge one. <laughs> like, I mean, they, they call this an empathy activity. But, I mean, I don't think, I mean, my point was not to be like, oh, poor blood person. I think, yeah. for, I think for me, what it did was, like, doing sets, this is a kind of side conversation about Lego in general, but doing the instruction sets of Legos, there's kind of controversy with people my generation oh, who are a little older, yeah. just like it's to make things conscious. without instructions. <laughs> so although I, I very much appreciate your, your talk about scale and architecture and being able to, to see things um, using the miniature, um, but it, it, it like renewed my sense of pleasure of doing the sets that I didn't, like when I, when I put a piece into another piece doing a set, um, it's not a huge obstacle to overcome, no, but it is in this context. It is in this context. So there's like a renewed pleasure of just like, hey, I snapped a two by one into the right position on this thing. <laughs> like, that's not a sense of that sense of pleasure doesn't usually happen for me until I get much farther along into the building process. So in terms of empathy, that was that was an emotional thing that was happening inside of me. I can use my left hand to that well. So from a left standpoint, it was hard, but with really careful guidance for um, everyone else, it after works. I got past how, how much difficulty there was in it, with the more help, I was able to finish it. I'm Miraculous. Doing it, with, <laughs> doing it with one hand is certainly a challenge, yeah. but as you said, the, the more help you get, the easier it is. And it's a great, just this kind of goes back to just people being helpful. So I think like my, one of the challenges, one of the things I had to remember was just like, since I'm totally blind, um, and it's really natural for me to do things tactily, um, it was, I had to remember like, no, I was sometimes tempted to sort of like jump in and be like, here, no, no, it goes like this, or, like, <laughs> you know, uh, but I think it was interesting to just watch everybody sort of figure out how to do things blindfolded, um, which is a very different, you know, experience. I think also one of the things, you know, some of us agreed on is like, you know, sorting the Legos in different, like it would have possibly been helpful to maybe sort them by size or, you know, ways where they're just more tactily, um, you know, it's, it's easier just to, to locate them tactily. Yeah, we also said, uh, you know, definitely having at least another bowl would help. And then um, some people actually help kind of describe the, the, what we were working on, like, for example, this is a wedge, it's going to be like a snow plow effect. So that helped kind of describe what we were, what we were trying to achieve for each piece. Um, and and I think, you know, we kind of dug in, so we probably made the least progress um, because we didn't, um, we also didn't let anyone really help that much. Mm -hmm. so, or there wasn't a lot of, you know, oh, not this piece, not that, oh, here, here, you know, push it to the front. So we, it was almost like everybody was independently doing their A lot of trial and error. Yeah, trying trial and error. Mm -hmm. and as if you were sitting down by yourself. <laughs> now each, each table had its own experience. Um, to the, uh, the question of uh, other applications, mm -hmm. uh, actually I have two thoughts, but um, the other applications thing is that <laughs> Um, actually use Lego in facilitating groups, whether it's a team building exercise or a company trying to figure out how to develop whatever it is they're trying to develop. Um, the application of allowing other team individuals to enhance their listening by addressing what assumptions 
are we making when we're describing or giving instructions mm -hmm. to a team, you know, the boss, to the staff. And there is a lot of inherent in, intimate vocabulary that we make a lot of assumptions about, but this process equalize everyone's assumptions. We just can't assume that everyone's going to see or describe a piece the same way. We had to work toward mutual vocabulary, and then the mutual vocabulary allowed us to instruct each other about you know where to put you know each piece. So uh, I think that was great. So that's what, how it hit me on an emotional level. It allowed me to address the assumptions about my own vocabulary and how everyone may use the same word but not have the same understanding of how we use certain words. So that was great. And I had a, oh, sorry, you go I had, a I, I had the same thing on that too. Um, it would be great, um, well, for construction projects. A lot of people do construction. I think this would be a great way to, for people, engineering, engineering as well. It's um, like how oh, they can use it pretty much for anything, like mapping out and yeah, structuring and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to vocabulary for a second, in terms of the instructions, we did our best to try and make some sort of universal, kind of easily understandable vocab, but of course there are ways to kind of change that. And that what's great about this system is it's malleable, and you can change, mm. you can change whatever vocab you don't like. But the one good thing is that our vocab stays the same from set to set. So. Uh, Ribbed stick is going to always be a ribbed stick. They're not going to change. The terms are always the same. Um, I would love to see, um, as you know, a totally blind person who is learning uh, origami, I would love to see more of those. Oh, we will. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. To, um, yeah, I mean, it would just be, uh, you know, I, and I think it's, it's an interesting sort of, in, in that context, I think it's sort of an interesting experiment in thinking about directional language and how when we you know when we refer to like up and down and left and, and you know we sometimes make a lot of assumptions and so I think it would be really interesting to see how like you know how we can c communicate those directions of language and origami is even more difficult because you're working with a single piece of paper you have first like upper side of the paper oh, must be folded down and all yeah. of these abstract, kind of abstract terms, unless you're very focused, you're going to be like, where am I? Yeah, yeah, and you have these different, like, um, you have these different, you end, up, you end up with like a million creases, and so sometimes it's like, okay, you know, sometimes um, there's actually a, a site where someone has uploaded accessible, some accessible work on the instructions. Um, I've seen those. Okay, yeah, I think that you probably did. And even some of those, like, I've kind of had to infer, you know, at times, like, okay, she means this, but I think she assumed, like, we knew that she was referring back to this, you know, step. Uh, I have to say, even cited origami instructions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like Very that. True. All of the cited people are like, these people don't know how to write instructions. <laughs> yeah. In the vein of, like, how this can be adapted to other systems, or it's like, I love how, um, Lego can be used to demonstrate a lot of demonstrate a lot of mechanical systems. Mm -hmm. um, with like the Mindstorm, like there's equivalents of cams and gears and pulleys and winches and like all of these systems that you can incorporate when you do the Mindstorm that helps you um, understand how um, actual mechanical systems work. Well, they are mechanical, but just made out of Legos. Um, yeah, like I've actually made a, a prototype of a prototype for a design project out of um, out of Lego. So I had an example of an accessible medical table that could lift up and lift down because um, it was like really hard to translate a solid work, like a 3D modeling software thing. And I was giving names to all the shafts and connection points. And it was really great to actually bring it in and have a physical model. Um, and I actually brought it in when I talked about um, with the IUCD interns a couple years ago about like what is engineering. I was like, there's this project, um, and I brought in the model of my model so that it was a tactile um, aid for visually impaired users or individuals. Our goal is to make those more mechanically 
thoughtful sets, the technic sets, as they're usually called, more accessible. But it's just very, those are the hardest for blind people because until you finish, everything is very abstract because yeah. it's all like oblong, lima bean shaped piece. Yeah, or like not. finding the language as you're going to describe sub assemblies mm -hmm. could be powerful. I was uh, thinking about, I grew up uh, as a visually impaired child um, doing a lot of dance and a, in a lot of dance studios. And the hardest dance for me to learn as a kid was Irish step dance. But if you go online, you can look up, like in Irish step dance, they call them reels or um, Kayleys. And so you can look up all the, a list of the steps that are in a Kaylee or in a, in a reel. And, but they don't have necessarily have the steps described. So it made me think, oh, like dance, you know, that people put those YouTube videos of the popular dances that all the kids are doing these days. Um, but are there written out instructions uh, for them? So dance could be a place um, and dance institutions and schools. This could be a, um, these kind of instructions could be an interesting way to bring uh, dance out of the uh, visual YouTube world and, and into uh, the hands of low vision or, or blind users or really anybody who it's just hard to follow the YouTube videos. But if you have the instructions written out, it might make it a little easier. Uh, an emotional uh, response to I had to this experience that I think could be applied, especially in um, academic areas, whether it's post-secondary, you know, high school, middle school, what have you, is going through the instructions and making an effort to place a piece in connection to another piece. With Lego allows you to make a mistake, and it's okay because it's easily correctable. That's a very good way to put it. And, you know, it's not like cement or, you know, I'm mixing paint, <laughs> oh, screw that up, you know, so now i got to get a new batch. Um, <laughs> The, the, the ability to not feel so devastated in that mm, that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, but you have two or three other opportunities to get it you know, right is I think a great um, insight and experience that, especially the post-secondary level, that many students should have. Only exception to that rule is when you're building something a little larger and you're like 10 yeah. steps later and you're like, oh, why is this thing not fitting? And well, then there's like, like stickers on it. Oh, Some sets yeah. come with stickers. Oh, don't get me started on <laughs> which, is, which is true. It on. It's I true. It's you know, but still with corporate, with corporate true. life and in industry, corporate setting, yes, that's, that's what we go through. Very true. So that's it's a realistic application for our lives outside of college. Very true. Any other thoughts on the application? Um, so I'm a very, very visual learner, and Minecraft is like one of my favorite video games. <laughs> and it was just interesting because I found this to be actually very visual when I was touching the pieces, like blindfolded. I, in my mind, I was kind of putting together how it was all fitting together. And it just really amazed me because, like, at first, it wasn't too much of a problem finding the pieces, so we got to kind of the weird curve pieces where it took me a second to adjust, but I, I'm, it kind of blew my mind, and I guess that's kind of my response to the emotional mm -hmm. part. It just kind of blew my mind how visual this still was. Mm -hmm. What's great about the visual learning aspect is the more, <coughs> the more exposure you get to this as a blind person, some blind people, depends on the people, but some people think more tactually and auditorily than they do visually, so if you're building a set, you can kind of look a couple of steps forward in your head and build it tactilely in your head. So it's all kind of, this visual learning aspect also does work for a lot of people. Uh, well, we're gonna wrap up this afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna give Matthew the last uh, words here and then feel free to um, grab any extra food or some water or a cookie for the road and um, exchange contact information with Matthew or myself and uh, yeah. we love we want this conversation to continue past this hour and a half and so bring it back to whoever you're representing today and um, tell them about your experience and what you learned today and on that note Matthew have any last words for us? Thank you so incredibly much for everyone coming and doing this and taking the time to do this. If you would like to contact me on my website, on Lego for the Blind, there is an email address which you can write to, and I will respond as soon as I get your email. And it would just be a pleasure to, to 
stay in touch with all of you and see how far we can take this project. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Thanks.